Sir Cliff Richard breaks down in court, saying he felt forever tainted after BBC coverage of a police raid on his home. The singer was giving evidence in his case against the corporation, claiming a breach of privacy over its reporting back in 2014. The BBC says its coverage was accurate and in good faith, and the raid was a matter of legitimate public interest. Also on the programme, Britain claims Russia had been spying on Sergei and Yulia Skripal at least five years before they were poisoned in Salisbury. The UN Secretary General warns of a new Cold War, with the US blaming Russia for rising tensions over Syria. No one is buying its lies and its cover-ups. Russia was supposed to guarantee that Assad wouldn't use chemical weapons. And Russia did the opposite. Jaguar Land Rover is to cut a thousand jobs, blaming a fall in sales of new diesel cars. And Tom Daly dives for gold at the Commonwealth Games and uses his victory to campaign for gay rights. And coming up on BBC News, manager Jurgen Klopp is taking nothing for granted as Liverpool are drawn to play Roma in the Champions League semi-finals, avoiding Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at Six. Sir Cliff Richard has told a High Court judge he felt forever tainted by the BBC's coverage of a police raid on his home in Berkshire following a sex assault allegation. The 77-year-old singer is taking legal action against the broadcaster following the raid in 2014. In his evidence to the court, Sir Cliff said that after seeing the coverage on television, he collapsed in his kitchen sobbing and that helicopter footage of the search of his flat has caused him profound and long-lasting damage. The BBC says its coverage was in the public interest. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning's report, contains some flash photography. Sir Cliff Richard often performs in front of thousands, but with his friend Gloria Hunniford alongside him, he came this afternoon to the High Court and stepped into the witness box, telling the judge of the torture and hurt caused by the BBC when it broadcast pictures of the police searching his flat in 2014. South Yorkshire police confirmed they're searching a property in Berkshire owned by Sir Cliff Richard. I could see the camera zoom to show the police wearing gloves rummaging through drawers, he said. I felt confused, disturbed and very upset. It was like I was watching burglars in my apartment going through my personal belongings. The singer was tearful at the beginning as he remembered seeing the BBC broadcast for the first time. He claims they portrayed him as a sex offender around the world before he'd even been questioned by police. Congratulations. Normally an energetic performer, the singer said the allegation of a historical sex offence against him and the BBC's coverage of it had changed him. He suffered physically and mentally, collapsing on his knees and sobbing the day after the broadcast. He was never charged or arrested and claims the BBC invaded his privacy. As Sir Cliff Richard was finishing giving his evidence, he broke down in tears saying, I'm not sure I can go on. He was listing the countries he claims where his reputation was ruined. He said, everywhere I have ever been, I felt my name was smeared. The police didn't do that. The BBC did. Sitting listening were BBC news managers Fran Unsworth on the right and Jonathan Munro. The BBC says it was in the public interest to run a story about a serious police investigation that was accurate and where information had been provided by the police. The South Yorkshire force who searched his flat has paid £400,000 to the singer in damages and more in legal costs and apologised. But it says the BBC was more responsible for his distress and should pay a share. Sir Cliff Richard was clear about the impact he claims this has all had. I felt forever tainted, the singer said. I still do. Lucy Manning, BBC News. 
Well, our legal affairs correspondent Clive Coleman is here. Clive, this is a case that raises several important issues. It is. Our privacy law is new and it's developing and privacy rights have been strengthened in the last two decades since the Human Rights Act created a statutory right to privacy. And we've seen in a number of cases that there are areas of our life, our health, our sex lives, for instance, where we are entitled to expect privacy. There the media can only report on those matters if there's an overriding public interest. This case is so significant because it is the first trial that looks at the privacy rights of a suspect, the right, if you like, not to be identified identified in the early stages of a police investigation and it's the first also to look at the workings of a national newsroom this national newsroom in deciding to name a suspect and it's so important in an internet age where if a suspect is named but is innocent the damage to their reputation can be instant and it can be worldwide now we work in the media we know that we like to get information out to the public that is our job but times have changed in terms of privacy rights and this case is going to determine I think whether being a suspect in a criminal investigation is essentially a private fact and it will determine what the media can and can't report on in the early stages of criminal investigations. Yeah. Okay, Clive, many thanks. Clive Coleman there. Now, the government's national security advisor says Russian military intelligence had been spying on Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia at least five years before they were poisoned in Salisbury in March. Sir Mark Sedwill, in a letter to NATO, says there's evidence Russia hacked Ms Skripal's email account in 2013. Our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, has more details. Nearly six weeks on, police cordons are still in place in Salisbury as the investigation continues. Today, though, the government provided new details to press its case that Russia was responsible. We already knew that the highest concentration of the nerve agent was found on the front door handle of Sergei Skripal's home. But today, in a letter to NATO allies, Britain's national security adviser Mark Sedwell said that in the 2000s, Russia began a programme to train special units and this programme subsequently included investigation of ways of delivering nerve agents, including by application to door handles. Mr Sedwell also claimed that Yulia Skripal had her emails hacked by Russian military intelligence, the GRU, at least as far back as 2013. Her father was seen by the GRU as a traitor because he'd spied for Britain. Some of these new details come from secret intelligence, collected in part by MI6. There had been a debate amongst officials about how much could be released, but the view at the highest levels was that it was important to provide as much as possible to try and convince doubters at home and abroad. This afternoon, Russia's ambassador in London was dismissive of the whole investigation. The investigation is conducted in the most non-transparent way. The British government refused to cooperate at all with the Russian authorities. Today's letter provides no smoking gun, but officials will hope that it supports the case that Russia had the means and the motive, even if it doesn't convince all the doubters. Gordon Carrera, BBC News. The Secretary General of the United Nations says the Cold War is back with a vengeance and warned of the dangers of a military escalation in Syria. His comments come as Russia claims it has irrefutable evidence that an alleged chemical attack in Syria was staged as part of an anti-Russia campaign. Our diplomatic correspondent James Robbins has more details. Douma is firmly back under Syrian government control. This is the ruined town where it's alleged President Assad's forces used chemical weapons a week ago. Rebel forces have now fled or been killed. Russian troops are in Douma too, claiming their part of victory, insisting they've found no evidence of any poison attack, no victims either. Western powers suspect there's been ample time to destroy evidence as the West finalizes plans for possible punitive strikes. At the United Nations Security Council, the cockpit where opposing powers fight with words, today the Secretary General warned that present military tensions between the West and Russia could spiral out of control. The Cold War is back, with a vengeance, but with a difference. The mechanisms and the safeguards to manage the risks of escalation that existed in the past no longer seem to be present. 
The United States says it has not yet decided on military action, but their estimates point to President Assad using chemical weapons in this war at least 50 times. All nations and all people will be harmed if we allow Assad to normalize the use of chemical weapons. Russia's ambassador painted a very different picture of Western powers fabricating a case in order to justify force and impose regime change. We continue to observe dangerous military preparations to an illegal act of force against a sovereign state in what would constitute a breach of international law. The West rejects that, so what could its military response involve? Well, the Americans have the USS Donald Cook in the Mediterranean, and it can hit Syrian targets with cruise missiles. They could be supported by British tornadoes based at RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus. Then the French have their frigate, the Aquitaine, as well as French Rafale fighter jets based in Jordan. US and UK submarines are in the region too, armed with cruise missiles. No one's suggesting there has to be confrontation with the Russians, but they do already have anti-missile defence systems at two air bases in Syria, with a range capable of reaching Cyprus. The Russians also have an unknown number of fighter jets in the region. Russia is now accusing British spies or special forces of fabricating the entire chemical weapons attack. In fact, we have irrefutable data that this was another staged event which involved special services of one of the countries trying very hard to be at the forefront of the anti-Russian campaign. Whatever precisely happened in Duma, Russia's defense ministry is now accusing Britain directly of organizing it. Britain calls that a grotesque, blatant lie. The war of words is louder than ever. Any military steps are still unknown. James Robbins, BBC News. Here, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has called for an independent UN inquiry into the suspected chemical attack and accused Theresa May of waiting for instructions from Donald Trump over possible action against Syria. It comes amid growing calls for Parliament to be given a vote on any military response. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. They are not waiting, convinced that any action against Syria will make matters worse. Western bombs are no solution uh, to the crisis in Syria. It's a terrible idea to go and bomb Syria. We disagree with the way the Tory government and Theresa May and Donald Trump is going about it. And the Labour leader, a lifelong anti-war campaigner, claims the UK is just waiting for instructions from America. Potential military action, Jeremy Corbyn suggests, will happen at the president's demand. She appears to be waiting for whatever Donald Trump decides to do, which I think is not a particularly positive message. The danger at the moment is if we go in with a targeted or massive bombardment, further civilians will die, further chaos will be caused and the war will escalate. But for a vocal minority in his own party, there's no choice but to respond to this fast. What's said to be the aftermath of a chemical attack on civilians by Syria's President Assad against all international rules. Not for the first time. Strikes in of themselves are important to show actually there will be a consequence every time chemical weapons are used against civilians in the way that Assad has been able to do without consequence for too many years now. And the government is resolved to act. What we saw in Cabinet yesterday was some detailed intelligence which I simply can't talk about. But you'll also have seen that Cabinet agreed that uh, the use of chemical weapons is not acceptable. It's not something that we will allow to, to continue. The Cabinet formally signed up yesterday to taking action, although with no specifics. And if strikes on Syria happen before Monday, MPs won't be formally asked. Whether or not the opposition is on board, whether or not the public's convinced. The expectation here is that the UK will take a place alongside America and France and take action against President Assad, maybe in the next 48 hours. The government has notably been quiet at putting forward any wider strategy. But strikes seem not a question of if, but when and exactly what. Strikes no way. Ministers know acting now won't stop arguments later. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster.
is at uh, the United Nations in New York. Nick, the Secretary General's warning of a new Cold War, it's certainly sobering, um, but pretty much sums up the atmosphere at the UN these days. The UN Secretary General is really worried, Clive, about a full-blown military escalation. But it's also worth noting that he didn't say there shouldn't be US-led airstrikes. And that reflects another concern at the UN, that the use of chemical weapons should not be allowed to become the new normal in war. Now, we've seen a war of words at the United Nations this morning. And we've also seen over the past 24 hours a public debate within the Trump administration. The U.S. Defense Secretary yesterday, James Mattis, injecting a note of caution, trying to put his foot on the brakes. But the U.S. Ambassador at the United Nations, Nikki Haley, really putting a foot on the gas this morning and laying out the case for airstrikes. Now, as I speak, she is on her way to Washington for meetings at the White House. And this, of course, is where this will ultimately be decided. We're in a holding pattern here at the United Nations. There's no meaningful diplomacy underway. We are all awaiting the decision of America's Commander-in-Chief, Donald Trump.